Thank you so much to everyone for coming to my presentation today for Wex Photo Video and Sony UK. My name's Alex Benyon and I'm a professional photographer, Sony Alpha creator, mental health awareness advocate, and today I'm going to be talking about the mental health awareness portrait project I launched last year and sharing a selection of images and videos of the people involved with the project. But before I get onto the project, I really want to share with you a bit of my own mental health journey and how photography has played a huge part in helping me with my own depression and the reasons behind starting the project. So my mental health journey began around my early 20s when I was first diagnosed with clinical depression and general anxiety. In a lot of ways, I was actually sort of relieved when I was first given this diagnosis. It answered a lot of questions I had and explained a lot of things about myself. And looking back through my life, I guess it's something that's always been there one way or another. My photography journey didn't actually begin until I was in my early 30s when I was going through a particularly dark depressive episode. There were multiple contributing factors going on in my life at this time and the medication I was on didn't appear to be enough. And so as my depression got worse, I began to lose all interest in everything I'd previously enjoyed. I had zero motivation, I started having more panic attacks and I eventually became suicidal. Thankfully, my incredibly supportive wife persuaded me to get professional help and to try and find a new passion and focus in life and that's when I decided to try photography and pick up a camera with serious intent. I guess like most people when you start photography you try all sorts of different genres and have a go at pretty much everything. Well it quickly became apparent I was terrible at landscape photography, had zero patience for wildlife photography and was bored silly by still life photography. And that's not a negative on the genres. I have a lot of respect and appreciation for the photographers who can excel at them. They just weren't right for me. So it wasn't until a trip to New York that I stumbled across an amazing street and documentary photography exhibition. And wow, it was genuinely the first time I had had any sort of emotional connection with photography. I was immediately drawn to the people, the moments, the stories, and all the humanity captured in these photographs, and I immediately fell in love with these genres. So I began learning more about the history and the amazing photographers that have shaped these genres over the years, the techniques they used, and I started implementing them into my own photography. And this approach to photography became my own therapy for depression. It gave me a reason to get outside, to spend time in the fresh air, and to take more interest in the world and the people around me. It honestly helped me to look at the world differently, and it seriously changed my life. And it's something I still rely on from time to time to help me when I'm struggling with my mental health. This past year in particular has been an incredibly difficult time for so many people across the world, so once again I turned to photography as a way to give me a focus. So once we entered the first lockdown back in March last year, I decided to use photography to document everyday life with my daughter and to try and capture what life was like. She is too young to remember this period of her life, but I want her to be able to look back on these photos when she is older and see what we did as a family during such an unprecedented time in the world. Not long after I'd started really focusing on street and documentary photography, I actually found out that I was going to be made redundant. So I decided to use that redundancy as an opportunity to try photography as a whole new career, but really had no idea what I was actually going to do. The obvious option was wedding photography, but honestly with the state of my mental health at the time, the thought of it filled me with dread. But when I discovered documentary wedding photography, I connected with it straight away. It was everything I loved about photography. It was storytelling, it was capturing genuine moments, and it was completely unobtrusive. Being an introvert, it was perfect for someone like me. I didn't have to talk to people or try and control and pose large groups. I could just watch and document and just be absorbed in all of the emotions and the stories that were happening throughout the day. This was when I first made my move into the mirrorless camera system. 
in particular the Sony Alpha system. I had been shooting weddings for a year or so and at the time thought if I wanted to be a professional wedding photographer I needed to look like a professional wedding photographer. So I had big dual pro bodies, big white zoom lenses etc and honestly I just stuck out like a sore thumb. This really didn't help with the unobtrusive nature of documentary wedding photography and I started to begin feeling like I was missing those natural moments because the moment I lifted those big camera and lenses up to my eye either at a wedding or doing street photography people would notice me straight away and start acting differently. So I ditched all my old kit and switched fully over to the Sony system and haven't looked back. The small bodies and prime lenses are perfect for me to shoot discreetly at weddings and the silent electronic shutter means I don't disrupt the ceremony or disturb the genuine moment I'm trying to capture. And being six foot six with a beard, I need all the help I can get blending in with the guests. Not only has photography been an amazing support for helping me with my mental health and giving me a whole new career, it's also given me some incredible opportunities I would have otherwise missed had I not picked up a camera. I've made some new amazing photography friends, worked with fantastic companies and brands in the industry, became a Sony Alpha creative, and I've given presentations and talks to hundreds of people all around the UK something I wouldn't have even considered doing previously. And a few years ago, I also got the opportunity to travel to South Ethiopia to photograph the amazing tribes and cultures of the Omo Valley, which was simply breathtaking and a real once in a lifetime experience. So a couple of years ago, I was thinking about all the amazing things and opportunities that I've been given, how much it had helped me and the doors that had opened for me through photography. And I started to explore ways I could possibly use photography and the platforms I'd been given to try and help others with mental health issues, as well as raising the awareness of the different types of mental health. When you look at the statistics in the UK, one in four people will experience a mental health problem in their lifetime. That pretty much guarantees everybody will know someone close to them who has had or is going through a mental health crisis, whether they realise it or not. And most shockingly of all, suicide is the single biggest killer of men under 45, and suicide in general is at a two decade high. Also, depression is the second leading cause of disability in the UK, with 70-75% to 75 of diagnosable cases not receiving any form of treatment. This is something that potentially is more treatable than other illnesses, but because people are too afraid or embarrassed to talk about it through fear of judgment or misunderstanding, these numbers continue to rise. I do think as a society, we have come a very long way with how we recognize and support people in situations where mental health is involved. However, I still think there is still a lot of stigma attached to mental health and society's perception of people living with mental health issues and that's why I started Portraits of Mental Health.
The aim of Portraits for Mental Health is to help try and end the stigma attached to mental health issues by sharing inspirational stories and portraying the real people behind the labels. Through video interviews and portrait photography, I want to show that the types of mental health issues are as varied as the people living with them. It really doesn't matter about their age, their race, their colour, their religion, their background. Mental health issues can affect anyone and everyone from all walks of life. But the main goal is breaking down the barriers associated with mental health problems to hopefully make support more accessible and so that society can start to understand a bit more about how mental health affects people. And by working with these amazing people and giving them a platform to share their stories through the project, hopefully people who are experiencing similar things will connect with the project and see that they aren't alone in what they're going through and stop feeling embarrassed or afraid to reach out to a friend or a GP to get the support they really need. So what I'd like to do now is show some very small snippets of the interviews and some portraits of a few of the people that have been involved with the project so far. All of the people involved and their full length interviews and personal stories are available on the project's website, portraitsofmentalhealth.co.uk and I would really recommend taking a moment to go over to the website to watch them. But right now I'm going to share a selection of them with you to give you an idea of what the project is all about. So I think from an early age I was aware genetically, mentally, I didn't feel the same as everybody else. I think you get a bit older and you just think, oh, I'm just the nerd at school, I'm just a bit of the the in-betweener, like, for TV reference. <laughs> um, but then I got older and I realised it's, it's a bit darker than that. It's a bit darker than just feeling misunderstood and... Um, I think a large part of having mental health issues um, and the like is just acceptance. It's just accepting that it's it's a part of who you are and that's okay. I think depression, um, clinical depression in my case, um, can provide you with empathy for others, which is really valuable to take with you in life. Um, and it's something that's needed in, in the world. I think the first time I wrote something and somebody responded to me, maybe on Twitter or LinkedIn or any of those platforms, and they said, um, this really helped me. Um, I was feeling a certain way and reading that made me feel less alone. And I think for the first time in my life, I thought, oh, this is what I'm meant to do. And I think people can relate when they find that thing. And you think, oh, this is fulfillment. It's not just um, paying the bills, it, it makes me feel like life is worth living and, um, and it's not all for nothing. So that was a little snippet of the interview we did with Mariam, a wonderful person I first saw on TV a few years ago. She produced an amazing short documentary for BBC Three about her experiences of living with depression and anxiety whilst also being a Muslim, specifically around the time of Ramadan. It was fascinating to see her talking with the Imam at her local mosque about how Islam recognises mental health and the support her religion gives her. She's also an amazing freelance writer and has written pieces for The Guardian, The Independent and lots of online blogs worldwide. And she's also very open about her own experiences, which is just what the project is about. Sharing these experiences might connect with someone in a similar situation. Maybe someone who is also a creative writer who then might be inspired to use creative writing as a form of therapy by sharing their own experiences with others. I put on courses of antidepressants which were um, very helpful, but of course what we didn't know back then was that I had bipolar. And so, of course, it made me ridiculously happy. And of course, I wouldn't go back to the doctors if I was happy, really. And, uh, and so it ended up bringing on some kind of very manic and hypermanic phases. Um, laced within some of my things, I had, I had sort of like paranoid tendencies. I was always nervous of what other people might be thinking or 
you know, the challenges that I was facing there. I ended up um, being very heavily medicated and uh, stayed on the wards for a, for a good number of months. Um, I think I was even sectioned at that point. But then I feel very, there's a lot of the, the, the bits of the condition that you where you can, um, gives you focus and, and, um, and there's a lot of um, bits of it that you can, you can use to your um, advantage. You see, what I realised was all these tools and these little tips and things and these little techniques were, were so, they're so simple. They're not complex. If it's complex, it doesn't work generally. But yeah, I think that it's so important that we focus on the things that can help us to, whatever that may be, whatever it is, it kind of then, it gives you, it gives you that bit of energy to feel that bit better and then you can approach it. So that was Peter, an amazing gentleman who I've had the pleasure of knowing for quite a while now. He was diagnosed with bipolar, he's been sectioned under the Mental Health Act, been through so much personal stuff, and he shared some amazing stories and experiences with the project. He's also a phenomenal musician and singer-songwriter, and has set up several creative projects to raise mental health awareness. One project, called The Little Yellow Book, is all about people sharing creative work that helps them, be it poetry, photography, music, painting, and distributes them to the community through universities, schools, and hospitals. He's done so much and has campaigned so hard for mental health awareness. So for him to come and talk about his own experiences with the project was amazing. It wasn't probably until my late 20s that it became a, a, what felt then to me like a real problem. I had a lot of other things going on at the time and there was one day that I got home from work and had a panic attack. And that was the day that I was like, this is your body trying to say to you, this anxiety is a problem and you need to do something about it. And so I went to my doctors, they were actually really good and um, they gave me some temporary medication to help with the panic attacks, but they also recommended that I go and see a counsellor. I know now that it's not about being a failure and it's not about not being good enough or, or all of these other insecurities and fears that kind of creep out in that time. Um, but when, when I'm in it that, is how it, that is how it feels. You sometimes feel so alone and stupid and ridiculous for having all these feelings, but then as soon as somebody else says to you, I have that same thing as well, Oh, I'm not that weird after all, I'm all right. <laughs> so that was a little clip of the interview we had with Naomi. I've known Naomi for quite a while, and if you were to meet her and talk to her in real life, you really wouldn't ever imagine that she has such crippling anxiety. And that's the whole point of the project. It's showing these people and their real life experiences. She shared her experiences working for several big radio stations in the past and how she's been able to step out on stage in front of thousands of people at radio roadshows, introducing huge musical acts. But in the same time, how anxiety and panic attacks aren't... But also how anxiety and panic attacks aren't always predictable and can be triggered by what some people would say are really very simple everyday situations. But she also talks about how she discovered yoga and how much that has helped her with her mental health. And in fact, how it inspired her to travel to India to train to become a yoga instructor so that she could then use that to help others. My accident, I pull hot boiling water over myself, which left me with third degree burns on the right side of my face, um, right side of my chest, arms and my back. And growing up um, with, with my scars, um, I, I just remembered certain times looking in the mirror and just not really being able to connect with the person look, looking back. 
and especially not being able to see anyone with scars. Growing up, I didn't see anyone with third degree burns. I didn't know what the different degrees were. Often in kind of really dark, darker times and darker days, I used to just really, I didn't really understand um, how I was going to cope and how I was going to like survive and if I would actually find like anyone to accept me or love me or um, just see, see me as quote unquote normal. Yeah. I got involved with a charity called Children's Burns Trust and they actually reached out to me and they're based in Essex and they're based in Essex Hospital. And I was lucky enough to be a mentor for young people, young survivors, and he done a week long camp, so I volunteered. Um, just talking about experiences, and I just never had that growing up. And it was a, it was really fundamental. It was it was really moving for me, um, um, to be able to share that experience with them, and just even thinking about it. So every time I think about it, I do get choked up because um, they're just so strong and brave. I really want to tell my story, how I want to tell it, and um, show the kind of span of what change actually looks like and what loving yourself looks like and the highs and the lows. So I want to put into a, put into a whole documentary um, called Brave Scar, and that's what I'm really excited about. And just meeting people, just meeting people and being able to um, talk to people and change people's lives. So yeah, that's what I'm excited about really, yeah. So that was a little clip of the interview with Justin and I absolutely loved having the opportunity to meet him and listen to his inspirational story. He suffered third degree burns from a childhood accident over the majority of his upper body but has used his experience of learning to live with and loving his scars to support others with similar experiences. He is a big promoter of body positivity and has been involved with some amazing body confidence projects and campaigns by bravely showing his scars off to the world. But he has also learned not to allow himself to be defined by his scars, which is exactly how I wanted to photograph him. I think a lot of times when people think about mental health issues, they immediately think of depression or anxiety but the types of mental health issues are far, far greater. There's PTSD, there's different types of body confidence, body dysmorphia, anorexia, eating disorders, the list is huge. And Justin's story is a perfect example of this. And again, all of these amazing people and all of their social media and website details are included with their stories on the website. I also asked them to write their own blog piece to go with the interview because I think it's really important that it's written in their words and it's not just me re and it's not just me rewriting their interview. So if you want to find out any more about these individuals and the people that I haven't had time to be able to share in this presentation, please go and check them out on the website. Firstly, I think the important thing for me is having a really really strong team supporting the project. And not only have James and Rebecca been there for the technical support, they've also been there for emotional support too, because there's been several times where I've been seriously doubting the project. Is it too much effort trying to juggle the project with everything else going on at the moment? Is it actually going to make any sort of positive impact? All the usual self-doubt things that I'm constantly fighting with in my head. But these guys have been there to help keep pushing me and the project on. And they've been absolutely instrumental in making the project shoots run smoothly. For example, when we're doing the video interviews, I know that James is taking care of everything technical and I'm not distracted by the cameras and the audio. And the interviews are filmed in a way so that the people that are involved are just having a regular conversation with me and I can just focus on that conversation and the stories being shared. I don't want them distracted by the camera or the equipment it's a relaxed and informal chat. They can say what they want, they can take as much time as they want, we can take a break whenever it's needed. It's just about having a natural conversation. And I find that doing the interviews before doing the photos actually gets the most nerve wracking part of the whole shoot out of the way so that when we switch to the portraits, we can just have a bit of fun. And Rebecca, the makeup artist, is phenomenal at her craft, but she also plays a huge role with settling the individuals into the shoot. The first thing that they do 
is go and see Rebecca for the makeup. And it's very, very subtle and simple makeup. We're not trying to do a makeover or anything crazy, but it's simply what's required for the filming photography. And sometimes things can get a bit emotional. So it's great to have Rebecca on hand to make sure everyone is looking their best. She's also exceptional at talking to them and making them feel at ease. Because ultimately, I'm asking these people to come and open up and share really personal and emotional stories about their life and about their mental health journey. And they've probably never been in front of the camera like this before and might be apprehensive about having their portrait taken, which if you've been on the other side of the camera, you know how uncomfortable that can feel. So Rebecca is great at that initial contact, settling them down and getting them comfortable. And that is a really important part so that when we start filming the interview, they're settled and relaxed. And in fact, having Rebecca involved with the project as well is great because she's also shared her own mental health journey with the project. And she's got a phenomenal story, which again is on the website. So to have someone like Rebecca involved in the project and to also be one of the people sharing their story, as well as doing all the stuff behind the scenes and supporting the project is great. And I absolutely love these guys to bits and everything that they've done so far for the project. When it comes to the portraits, I wanted to keep things relatively simple with the technical approach so that I could easily reproduce the same look and set up in pretty much any location. I also wanted to shoot everyone involved in exactly the same way so that there is a consistent look to the portraits and so nobody feels they were treated differently. So for the lighting I decided on a simple one light butterfly lighting pattern with a collapsible white beauty dish. I found butterfly lighting to be the most flattering lighting setup across a broad range of face shapes and it has such a classic traditional look to it. The beauty dish modifier I use gives real impact and pop to the portraits with really defined shadow and highlights, but the white interior softens the specular highlights for a more flattering look on the skin. Also having the lighting in a butterfly setup means if the subject is moving during the shoot, it's not going to make a huge difference in the direction they're looking. And it's why the photos aren't traditionally posed. Like my documentary work, I'm trying to capture those fleeting moments of a personality or an emotion. So if the individual has shared their story of living with a mental illness, but in their portrait they're smiling, that's great. It will hopefully reduce the misconception that just because someone has a mental health issue, it doesn't mean that they never smile or laugh. So I try to have a bit of fun with the person during the shoot. We chat about everything and nothing. I ask them questions that might elicit a great reaction or expression. And a huge benefit of using the Sony system for me with this portrait project is the fact that I can really rely on the amazing eye autofocus and using the screen on the back of the camera to compose my shots. I find this gives me a much better connection with the people I'm photographing. I know the camera is going to be doing the focusing and following the face and I'm not going to have the camera covering my face and blocking my eye line. I can keep that all important eye contact with the subject whilst I'm talking to them. And I just know that the camera is going to do all the hard work. And when the moment is right, I can get that real moment when the wall comes down and the personality shines through. I can take the shot and know it's going to be in focus. Also the size of the system, is a lot less intimidating for the sitter. For me, it just fits into my workflow and my style and my approach really well. I've always been drawn more to the aesthetics of black and white photography. And again, this is really reflected in my documentary work. So for the final editing, I decided to work in black and white. And I think with doing these portraits in black and white, the visual distractions like clothing color are massively reduced and it really allows you to focus on the individual. I also think it's quite a flattering format to shoot in and ultimately these people have an illness and I know from my own experience that when I'm having a particularly bad day 
I'm not exactly going to be full of colour in the face. I'm going to be a bit tired. I'm going to be drained. So by shooting in black and white with the so by shooting in black and white with the butterfly lighting pattern, I'm trying to ultimately produce a genuine and flattering image of that person, because ultimately they're bearing their soul for these images, and as the photographer, they're putting so much trust in me to capture their likeness in a really pleasing way. Also importantly, none of the final images have been retouched in any way. So other than the editing for the aesthetic choice, there's no skin retouching, no hair retouching, because ultimately it's also about helping to promote body positivity. It's about showing the real person and everyone involved is aware of that and they're happy for that. So the project's future. Obviously it's taken a bit of an impact over the last year because of everything that's been going on, but I'm really hoping to start shooting again with the aim of photographing as many people as I can from all sorts of places and walks of life. And then hopefully partner up with a major mental health charity like Mind UK, where we could work together on the project. I would love to work with this charity to eventually release a book of all of the photos and the stories of everyone involved with the goal of the profits of that book sale going to the charity to then be put back into other projects helping people with mental health. And for me, that would be coming full circle on my journey of photography helping me when I needed it the most, to me then using photography to hopefully help others. But that's the end of the presentation. It's only a small look at the project, but all of the information, interviews, photos, and stories are all over on the website, portraitsofmentalhealth.co.uk. And please do go check them out. These people are amazing and what they've done and agreed to share with the project, I honestly can't thank them enough. And I hope that the project can really continue to grow and keep sharing stories and helping others. And if anybody wants to chat or have any questions about the project or the kit I use, etc., you can hit me up on social media or you can message me through the website however you want. I'm happy to talk. But before I finish, I just want to say a massive thank you to Wex for the opportunity today to share the project with you all and Sony who have been a huge support for me as a professional photographer and giving me opportunities to do presentations like this. And of course, thank you to everyone for taking the time to come and listen to the presentation today. I really appreciate it. But please, if you're struggling and you're struggling to cope, the best thing you can do to begin with is open up to someone. Talk to someone, whether it's a friend, whether it's a doctor, whether it's a family member. The main thing is don't be afraid or embarrassed. And if you're struggling to do that, there's some great charities and foundations offering support. You can ring them up and speak to someone confidentially and you might be able to open up to them easier. But ultimately, don't be afraid to ask for help.